This is the motto of the show Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, but gold still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by his death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman popes rule the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome's sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man. Salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit. A compromise Beware the ancient Papal lie With such a cloud Of witnesses Who by grace Died in their Lord Recall their Memory to say By the same Faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody to a new show from Hour of the Truth from Juggler 66. It's been quite a while since I've been recording a show on Hour of the Truth. I know that, but I know also that you will have it very easy to forgive me because you know that I've been very, very busy doing a lot of things and a lot of projects. Not even alone all the time, but sometimes even with my wonderful brother in Christ over there in Minnesota in the United States of America, Brett Norman, who is going to join me tonight. Thursday, the 22nd of December 2016, on this show, Hour of the Truth, that I asked him quite spontaneous, well, when you're home and you have the time, do you want to join me? And of course, my brother had nothing else to do than say, of course, I'll join you. <laughs> so, Brett, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you, Yarg. It's great to it's be here. And... Uh, Yes, it's absolutely. Ahead. It's great to be here and great having you on the show because we thank yeah, you. We, we yes, we're just working on this project together. And that project, of course, the yes, people know that already that is uh, <laughs> All Roads Lead to Rome, a book that I have been reading for the past few months. And uh, you still are and were in the past and will be in the future busy putting the pictures together for all the videos that are being made. And you just produced this wonderful teaser for the book reading, an hour and a half long in English, <laughs> and even a few minutes longer in a language that you are not even able to speak. You produced a German <laughs> teaser. How was that? Tell us about that experience, Brad. Well, I can tell you that uh, that experience was uh, uh, guided by the Holy Spirit, of course, and also being familiar with your reading of, of the English version. And, you know, since I chose the uh, specific quotes and put them together in an order, you know, that they appeared in the book, it was easy to, uh, you know, catch uh, at least vague terms um, 
uh, and cues where I could cue in a different portion of the the video that I put together from the English. So it just made it even more interesting for me because I've been to Europe once. I was in Europe in 1989, and that, that's a long story in of itself right there. <laughs> And I actually had a, a fantastic time, and uh, but uh, you know, there's always a, a, a bigger story, and I won't even go into oh. it. <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> oh no, no, no! It's far too long. I could write a book. <laughs> okay, on that. start tonight. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, I hope to be of some benefit to your listeners on this broadcast. And, and we're dealing specifically with, uh, with uh, the topic of, of the ecumenical movement in the book. And I find that a very fascinating topic myself. It is. It is. Having, and yes, having been a product of the Protestant, the apostate Protestant church that I have left and that— uh, I find, you know, every day I look deeper into the uh, the entire scope of what is happening today in the Lutheran Church. It just becomes more and more uh, mm. shocking. Let's just put it that way. You know, the that the the position that the Protestant Church is in today it just becomes more and more. Shocking. It also were quite interesting times. Uh during the recording uh, when I read the book and uh, that you were producing the video, we have had uh, the American elections mm. in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Or, or, or mm -hmm. should I say, or, or, should, right. or, should, I, or, oh, or, yes. or should I say the Walt Disney selections uh, between, uh, between <laughs> Donald <laughs> Duck and Hillary, I don't know. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, that, that, right. that fell right, right in that time. Yeah. And, and also something else was uh, quite interesting happened mm -hmm. in... Uh, I think uh, the last month, during the month of November, um, mm -hmm. the 33rd uh, meeting came together of the High Council of the Congregation, or let's say, of the Jesuit order. And they elected mm -hmm. another black general for the second That's time right. in succession, something new in the history of all the Society of Jesus and almost their almost 500 years of history now, uh, it happened that the reigning black, black Pope just resigned from office. He didn't die as it used to be required, <laughs> let's say, in this term, because mm -hmm. normally that is a post that you have for life. And the only... Um, a black pope that preceded uh, Adolfo Pachon Nicolas, who resigned now in 2016 before, was his predecessor, Peter Hans Kolvenbach, or Hans Peter Kolvenbach, the Dutch guy. And mm -hmm. that was in 2008. And so after that, they placed Nicolas Pachon. And now, uh, Nicolas, uh, Adolfo Nicolas, and now Adolfo Nicolas made place for a new black pope. And this new black pope is called, uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember his prenum, but his last name is Sosa, if I'm not mistaken. Sosa, Eduardo Sosa right. or something. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that possible, Eduardo? I don't know. Uh, it sounds right, but I, yeah. I can't verify that right now because I don't have that ne in front of me neither. either. Neither can I. <laughs> people, so can, new. people can look <laughs> that up. Anyway, his last name is Sosa. Yeah. And one of the more interesting things is, and uh, I know that we talked about that while during a Bible study we have with Tom Fress uh, every Saturday mm. night, mm -hmm. um, we spoke mm -hmm. about that the fact that not only Jorge Borgoglio, the so-called white pope, the very first Jesuit on the seat of the white pope, um, comes from Argentina, South America, but now also the new elected black pope is the first one to come from South America, namely Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that quote-unquote coincidence? Mm. Well, uh, you know, it's so we have a South American uh, Jesuit white pope 
and we have a South American <laughs> Jesuit general, black pope. And we have Benedict the Sixteenth, who is just sitting there in Rome. And then we have Adolfo Nicholas Pashan, whatever he does. I don't know. I don't keep tabs on these guys every day. But it certainly is interesting, and isn't we it? And have Peter Hans Kolfenbach, who still is alive, as yes, far as I know. So uh, at this right. moment, at that's this right. moment, we have officially three black popes, one in office, two out of office. And we have two yes. white popes, one in office and one out of office. And That's this correct. is for the so very first five, time in okay. history that in succession uh, the black pope got elected while the reigning black pope, black pope resigned from office. And also it only was the second time in the history of the papacy of the Antichrist, let us not forget to tell our listeners, that the papacy right. still is That's the right. Antichrist of the Bible, people. And it That's only right. was the second time with the resigning of uh, the German um, Pope XVI Ratzinger, who led for 25 years the office of the Inquisition before becoming the White Pope, by the way, for the people who didn't know that, he only was the second in the history of the White Popes resigning, living from his post. So I think there is something going on that we do not know about. They have an agenda, of course, that they play. But, Brett, mm -hmm. should we be worried about their agenda? No. Exactly. No. We need to pay attention to it, but we don't need exactly. to worry. That's that's exactly. Christ. He, he is with us. And that is us. why we do not participate in any guessing games and any of this discussion games and whatever, you know, because it doesn't matter what mm -hmm. the devil does. The only interesting thing is That's what right. Jesus does. And what Jesus does for us and what we, in the second place, most of all, can do for Jesus. And, That's right. And that That's we right. Amen. can take care that more and more people get their eyes opened to the deception the mm -hmm. Jesuits are playing on their full spiritual ratio studiorum theater all over the world like now mm -hmm. you know we have today the 22nd of december three days ago we had the attacks in berlin that some people asked me so what are you saying about the attacks in berlin where this truck ran into the people and killed 12 and 48 are wounded and they don't mm -hmm. tell us anything mm -hmm. about it I saw a video from Conrevi, mm -hmm. which is a German channel, who who was speaking about that the driver was even killed. Uh, uh, that was a Polish guy who was even killed long before that. Nobody spoke of that. Because when they first reported from that so-called attack there in Germany, uh, they said that the driver died at the place. But that's impossible. He died hours before and he was even shot. And they didn't mention that. I mm -hmm. mean... And, and and I don't participate in all this stuff, uh, all these things that are coming on. But I I just want to go back a little bit to the black pope, mm -hmm. this new mm -hmm. this new black sure. pope Sosa coming from Venezuela. The funny thing is the quote unquote coincidence, as many people would call it, I call it the working of the Holy Spirit, was that at the same time that Sosa was elected, I watched a video, wherein there was an interview of Alan Greenspan who has been for many, many years, through the 90s and the beginning of the years 2000, the CEO of the <laughs> Federal Reserve Bank, that Jesuit-owned banking system, that, indebted, mm -hmm. that right. indebted not only the United States of America into oblivion, but the whole world. Okay? That's right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. this Alan Greenspan was on an interview and he said something very, very interesting and something very, very profound. And I would like you, Brett, to play this little audio recording that we have that I took out of the video for our listeners to listen that. And then we can maybe discuss that for a few minutes before we go, uh, before we will start reading an understandable history of the Bible, which deals today with the subject, the diabolical Jesuits. We 
could not have planned this better, as it falls all into the plans of the Holy Spirit to do it this way. That's right. Okay, so I'm all queued up and ready to go. I'll just turn the speaker up. Hopefully we won't feed back. Okay, here it goes. It seems barely a day passes now without some big-name person warning of imminent collapse. The latest is Alan Greenspan. In an interview on Thursday, he told Fox News that Venezuela is now under martial law and that America is next. He said that what was happening in Venezuela was inevitably going to take place in the U.S. Let me ask you about what's going on in Venezuela, Doctor. I mean, you've seen these protests, riots. There's video that we got the Fox it showed people uh, collecting and eating out of garbage cans. Uh, a lot of folks have looked at that and said, you know, that could happen here. It could get off the wheels fast here. What do you think? Well, I think on our way there, we basically go through Greece. Okay. <laughs> well, on the I way think there, we, are we basically the go way through there. Greece, is what he said. Yeah, yeah That's I would agree. what he said. Mm -hmm. And why are we on the way there? Because already now, more than 50 million American citizens are eating from, I won't say garbage dumps yet, but they are on food mm -hmm. stamps. And mm. the day that the government will stop putting out these food stamps, these people will be eating out of the garbage. And mm -hmm. if anyone, I think, if anyone should be in the know about things like this and giving away here and there a little tip of the iceberg information is Alan Greenspan in this interview. Sure. Sure, and I do believe this interview was 2015, 2014, somewhere in there, right? It doesn't right? even matter when the interview was. It was it, no, it was a little it while, was a while ago. ago yeah. But mm -hmm. the point is, mm -hmm. the point is that we right. are now faced with a Venezuelan black pope, general of the Society of Jesus. Correct. And I personally do not think that those are coincidences right because in venezuela they are eating out of dumpsters they are in severe economic collapse so if alan greenspan former head of the federal reserve says it's coming here he probably isn't joking around, uh, given, you know, I've read uh, The Secret Terrorists on my channel, and uh, I know I'm not, you know, producing uh, the, the latest because I've taken a break from it, but I'm going to get back to it. But that's not the point here. The point is, is that I've read a chapter on the uh, sinking of the Titanic, and uh, that's a very major, major Event. Yeah, you're reading that in The Secret Terrorists, uh, that is a book from Bill Hughes. Yeah. And I uploaded correct. that on my second channel, Jordan's War, on different uh, on uh, this info uh, in the series from Bill Hughes called Behind the Door, The Sinking That's of right. the Titanic. Mm -hmm. And it deals, of course, more or less with the same stuff. And it is just about getting rid of the opposition that the Jesuits had, that they needed to found the Federal Reserve System a system that they needed to produce money out of nothing to pay for the First and the Second World War that was planned, because that war could not have started without the Federal Reserve. And there That's are correct. many, many, many other things to talk about when you talk about these things, like you have the Depression of 1929, Black Friday, mm -hmm. and a few months before mm -hmm. that, the Lateran Treaty and the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, got back hold of his, of his civil power and was paid by Mussolini 750 million lira, which is about 100 million dollars in the beginning in March of 1929. And a few months later, the Jesuits, who control the papacy, crash the financial market and the Vatican has the money 
to buy all the stocks a penny for a dollar or a dollar for a penny or how do you say that when when you buy something cheap mm -hmm. you know that's right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and what yep. kind of situation are we today we have had in 2008 the so-called financial crisis and we haven't gotten out of it and there have not been any solutions because there is no solution to a debt based money system except for abolishing it and i think that we are going into quite interesting times and we will see what the new jesuit general will have up his sleeve while we go through the times right now and i think these are quite interesting times and i think there are a lot of people who have never heard about that interview from alan greenspan and maybe they are starting to add one and one together which is simple calculation not high mathematics Sing simple calculation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anyway you got any more of that subject well sure i mean it's uh you know you you just bring up the fact to any american here where i live like say my coworkers that i work with every day that you know the american federal reserve bank is a uh is a creation of uh, of the uh, Roman Catholic institution. Uh, you know, it really bothers people to hear the history behind what America really is. You know, but we need to face it. We need to face it. We need to come to grips with it as Christians, as Bible believers. And also we need to come to grips with the church the church and the state. And that's what's so fascinating about this book, yeah. Yard, that you are reading, that you have read, and that uh, you know, you're gonna be releasing these videos very soon, is that it is all about the precursors before uh, the, the world we're living in today, this, this, this uh, world that's emerging out of, out of America and being broadcast to all the other countries and, and being shoved down the throats of every family, you know, in the world practically, mm -hmm. you know, is this, this uh, incredible propaganda that we have to swallow. I mean, it is just... Uh, you know, you look for answers in, in uh, quote, alternative, unquote, places, and you end up with listening to people like, uh, who's this guy? Um, oh, uh, I forget his name, Noam Chomsky. Yeah. <laughs> people like this, you know, they, they're insiders. These, these are Knights of Malta. Hmm. And they... Gerald Salente, have Peter a big Schiff, agenda. you know, these so-called financial oh, experts. Yes. They're mm -hmm. all in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard to come to grips with that. Our alternatives are even completely bought and paid yeah. for. Well, alternatives, you speak about alternative media, I guess, right? Yeah, right. You always, right. Have, to, yep. uh, you always have to put back in your mind the knowledge of the papal encyclical uh, Miranda Prosos mm. and Intermirifica That's right. to know... To know mm -hmm. Who owns all media, press, movie, television, internet, social media, everything that we call radio, everything that we call media, let it be official or let it be so-called alternative, is owned by the Roman Catholic Church. And anybody who says, oh, now Jörg is absolutely telling BS, because it's the Jews, I mm -hmm. can only tell two things. First of all, go to the playlist Hour of the Truth on my channel and check out episode, I think, number 49 or something called It is Simply Amazing. And second, go to the Vatican website, whatever Vatican website you want to go to and type in Miranda Prosos and type in Intermirifica. And you will see for themselves that they say that it is the inerrant right of the Roman Catholic Church to own and possess all media. Blank point. Point blank. Mm -hmm. That's right. Any discussion on that point is done. 
just have to go to the sources and do your own research. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, are we going to do a little reading on an understandable history of the Bible? The, the, I'm ready to go whenever you are. The diabolical yeah. Jesuits, this part is called. And I'm sorry, folks, it has, it has been a while, but I'm still taking on to f finish this whole book. And I have to repeat again before I start today that you are calling that be please back into your mind. I am not a follower of Samuel C. Gibb, the author of this book. I do not agree with everything that he writes in this book. I do not agree with everything that he said in his life or that he put out on videos or whatever. But taking this book, reading this book and evaluating this book and discussing the things in there that are spiritual right, I think is very important. We are now reading today the Diabolical Jesuits and we are still dealing with chapter 7 of the book called The Enemy. We have seen so far the invasion. We have seen the plot, the counterattack, and have now come to the Diabolical Jesuits on the bottom of page 43 in the PDF if you want to read along. And you know, as always, the link to the PDF is provided for you in the description box of this video so you can always read along and discuss along with us and that's so nice that I have Brett here with me tonight that I don't have to read alone but I have someone who can interrupt me for here and there maybe a comment and a little discussion on things and um, of course the books the book I read all roads lead to Rome dealt with the ecumenical movement but it also dealt of course with the Jesuits and now, a little later, after that book was uh, completed, I got from another brother in Christ in the United Kingdom, uh, so that's over here in Great Britain in Europe, sent a book that is called The Foundations Under Attack, The Roots of Apostasy, by the same author who wrote All Roads Lead to Rome, Michael de Semlian, who is, as you probably know or do not know, then you learn that now, associated with Richard Bennett, who has been a 22-year-long priest of the Roman Catholic Church. The Foundations Under Attack is a book Michael de Semlian wrote and published in 2006, and this you can always call, almost call the succession to All Roads Lead to Rome, and I will have that on my reading list for the future. That will also come. And All Roads Lead to Rome and Foundations Undertake Tech also deals with the Jesuits. And here first, with the Diabolical Jesuits, we go a little bit into the history of the Jesuits. Not very deep, I can tell you that right away. If you want to learn a little bit deeper about the founding of the Jesuit order, I advise you to go to my book reading of Rulers of Evil, where there is a complete playlist of the whole reading, complete reading of that book, in English and for the people who want to have that in German I only have to upload the last chapter all the rest is also translated into German it's to be found in the same playlist rulers of evil and F Tupper Frederick Tupper Saucy dealt in much more detail with the diabolical Jesuits than the author here of this book an understandable history of the Bible does but that is because this book deals with another subject this book does not deal with the rulers of evil. This book deals with an understandable history of the Bible. So, without any further delay, I'm sorry for all this boring introduction, now listen. <laughs> I start on the bottom of page 43 in the PDF. The Society of Jesus was founded in 1534 by a Spaniard by the name of Ignatius Loyola. Loyola was born Don Inigo Lopez de Recalde in the castle of Loyola in the province of Guipuzco. Uh, oh, I could read that when I was reading it quietly for myself. <laughs> Guipuzcoa <laughs> in 1491. By the way, the same year Martin Luther was born. He was known as a youth to be treacherous, brutal and vindictive. He was referred to as an unruly and conceited soldier. Loyola was wounded at the siege of Pampul Pampeluna in 1521, so age 30. 
Crippled by a broken leg and plagued by a limp of the rest of his life, he sought spiritual conquests. Loyola produced an elite force of men, extremely loyal to the Pope, who would set about to under, uh, un, uh, undermine Protestantism and heresy throughout the world. Their training would require 14 years of testing and trials, designed to leave them with no will at all, or, as is stated in the Oath of the Jesuit, the Fourth Oath of Induction, Ferende ac Cadaver. We say in Germany, Cadaver gehorsam, meaning, no will of my own, I am acting like a zombie, I do everything my hierarchy tells me. And that their training would require 14 years of testing and trials is not completely correct, because the complete education takes 20 years. And I dealt with that when you go to the playlist Nothing But The Truth and go back to the video on the uh, Jesuit Oath. And there I will read a paper from a Belgian Jesuit uh, who comes from the same town where I live in, here in Leuven, who wrote a paper about the education of the Jesuits and uh, that's 20 years. But 14 years already is very long when you know that you will be brainwashed all the time with their spiritual exercises, most and for all. They were to learn to be obedient. Loyola taught that their only desire would be to serve the Pope. The head of the Jesuits is called the Black Pope and holds the title of General just as in the military. Why? Because when the order of the Jesuits was founded was admonished by Pope Antichrist Paul III in 1540, he ordained them by a papal bull called Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae, which means the Church at War. The Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, La Compania de Jesus, is from the start a military order. It is militarily organized and it deals militarily. It acts militarily. It is a military. The Jesuits are not a monastery, uh, are not monks from a monastery. They are soldiers, and when they come to your country, they invade your country like foreign alien soldiers, because they do everything only for the benefit of the Pope in Rome. So they are an invading Roman military order in every country they go to. Now... Ask yourself in the United States of America over there. Georgetown University is the most respected and highest standing Jesuit university, very much near Washington, founded by the first Jesuit bishop in the United States of America. John Carroll, mm -hmm. in 1989, and look at what Georgetown University produced for kind of people for your country the last 50, 60 or even more years. They, yeah. Yes, brother, you meant 1789, uh, right? What, what did I say? <laughs> Yeah, seventeen eighty-nine. It's okay. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. At the same time that the United yeah. States of America became a nation. I had to. I had yeah. to say that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I have these years. Yeah. You know. That's okay. Yeah. It's all right, man. It's a lot to yeah, take yeah, in. But, you know. Uh, you know, I don't have notice of this. What I'm saying here. So. Uh, it can That's okay. Me. That's why I'm here. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> I love you, brother. Thanks. Yes, but it's really interesting you you let into the spiritual exercises because that's exactly what's being shoved down the throat of the Protestant, Protestants mm -hmm. right now, is the spiritual exercises. We've been brainwashed. And speaking for myself, coming out of the Protestant church, and it's taken me a long time to even look at this 
a long time to even know that this is a problem. Mm. You know, why should I be in a church that wants to do this? No, it's not a good idea to be involved with a church that's uh, uh, doing anything involved with Jesuitism to the smallest degree. It's not okay. Get out. That's what the Lord says. Come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins, so you receive not of her place. Absolutely. Right? Revelation 18, verse 4. And that goes for the Protestant church. They're in apostasy really bad, and they don't want to hear it. They really don't want to hear it. They don't want to look at their cross and see that IHS in the center of it. Mm. They, oh, no, 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 that's the Christogram. Oh, we have our little, they got their little agenda, you know. They, they don't read the Bible in these churches. And when they do, it's cited from the, the, little, uh, the little folder they give you. What do you call that again? A pamphlet or whatever they give you when you sit down. Uh, I forget what it's called. I'm sorry, but, you know, I mean, you're not encouraged to bring your Bible to church. And if you are, it's always an NIV or an RSV or a blah, blah, blah. It's not the authorized version, 1611 King James Bible. That's the problem. That's right. And um, let me just... Just let me just go a little bit to this new book that I am reading, The Foundations Under Attack. I was Please. just today reading a little bit on page 35, which is part of chapter 5, Historicist Expositors in the, of the 19th Century. And it was speaking about E.B. Eliot and his wonderful four-volume work, Hore Apocalyptice, which many people do not even know what that means. That doesn't mean Hore. That means hurrah, that means ours with the apocalypse. Hmm? And um, H. C. Spurgeon, C. H. Spurgeon, who was himself a historicist or a continuist, as he called it, described Eliot's work as the standard work on the apocalypse, a monument of both historical and theological scholarship, hurrah apocalyptice, traces the main streams of interpretation handed down through the centuries by the great cloud of witnesses and illuminated by the Holy Spirit through the light of history. It shows with a wonderful white of evidence the in lingering detail how the book of Revelation has been fulfilled right up to the sixth vial in chapter 16. Historicists, and this is a footnote, and this is the reason why I'm reading that to you, and you will understand why I'm reading that to you with the last little quote that comes from Revelation 16, verses 13 through 14, which I will end this little ex uh, uh, excursion into the book, The Foundations Under Attack, right here. And then we will see the collection to what Brett just said. So let me just keep on for a moment. Historicists, the author says in this footnote, writing then and now about that important period of church history in Victorian Britain, have identified it with the sixth vial of Revelation prophecy. The rising apostasy, the assault of Darwinism, and liberal higher critical scholarship along with the downgrade of doctrine, the Oxford movement that started in 1830, that is after the... Um, uh, Emancipation Act, that Roman Catholicism was back allowed in England at that time, the advancing Romanizing agenda in the Anglican Church and the adoption of Futurism, all leading to the 1881 revision and corruption of scriptures, the New King James Version, prompt them to cite the scripture in Revelation 16, verses 13 through 14, quote, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world. Unquote. Do you see the collection that you can do between the book All Roads Lead to Rome 
the foundations under attack, and even the book, An Understandable History of the Bible with the Evil Jesuits that we are reading right now from, Well, oh yes, if you're asking me, I'm yeah. Just, you're the uh, only one on the call here. Always. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just like to leave it open for a little bit because uh, you know our listeners need to think about this good and long and hard, just like I do. <laughs> Listen, I'm just going to continue with one little more paragraph here in this book. Please Elliot go right went ahead. On to show. <clears throat> I'm sorry. No, I'm going to back up a little bit here. E.B. Elliot also wrote of the new futurist scheme, quote, it has a great advantage over every other form of interpretation in that it is now not chained down by the facts of history. It can draw on unlimited powers of fancy wherewith to devise in the dreamy future whatever may seem to fit the sacred prophecy, unquote. Elliot went on to show the insuperable difficulties attending the futurist scheme, how it sets language, grammar and context at defiance, how inconsistency marks, fr marks it from beginning to end, how erroneous is their conception of Antichrist, how self-contradictory and illog illogical, how opposed to history, scripture, and the ancient fathers in the futurist view of the religion of Antichrist, but that it is, even intellectually speaking, a mere rude and commonplace conception of Satan's predicted masterpiece of opposition to Christ, compared with what has been actually realized and established in the papacy. The papal system is beyond anything that the futurists have imagined, or ever can imagine, the very perfection of anti-Christianism." This is Reverend E.B. Elliot, quote from Baron Porcelli in the book The Antichrist, His Portrait and History. And I think this is a link to another interesting book to read in the future. But we, before we mm. go from one to another, I hope that you saw the connection here, what I just wrote to you from the book The Foundations Under Attack, and the comment that um, Brett made on the education of the Jesuits, which I told you takes about 20 years and mostly deals with spiritual exercises. So continuing in the book, I'll just go up one sentence back. The head of the Jesuits is mm -hmm. called the Black Pope and holds the title of general just as in the military. And I explain to you that the Jesuits, La Compagnie de Jesus, that's why it's called the Company of Jesus. It's a military term. Hello! They are a military order. That they were to be unquestionably loyal to this man, and their church is reflected in Loyola's own words quote, Let us be convinced that all is well and right when the superior commands it. Also, even if God gave you an animal without sense for master, you will not hesitate to obey him as master and guide, because God ordained it so to be. He further elaborates. We must see black as white, if the church says so. Unquote. The devil's plain clothesman is the next part of this chapter called. What would be the method used by the Jesuits to achieve that goal? Would it be military might? Would it be acts of daring? Would it be a violent revolution to install a Roman sympathizer as ruler? No, these actions would all have their day of usefulness later. The Jesuits were to be the Vatican's plain clothesmen. They were founded to be a secret society, a society that was to slide in behind the scenes and capture the positions of leadership. The Jesuits knew that to capture the leaders of any particular country or organization is to conquer the entire body. Edmond Paris, 
the noted French author and leading authority on the Roman Catholic Church, has written many books exposing the true spirit and goals of the Vatican. And I cannot help to make a little pause here and name a few of the wonderful books Edmond Paris, a French author, wrote on the Jesuits. One is the one that I am reading right now and will be uploading after All Roads Lead to Rome is done on my channel, and that is called The Secret History of the Jesuits. Another one is called Le Vatican contre Europe, or in English, The Vatican against Europe. And there is even another one, very interesting, published through Chick Publications, called Convert or Die. Edmond Paris is really an author you should look into if you haven't done so yet. Edmond Paris points out, quote, Politics are their main field of action, as all the efforts of these directors concentrate on one aim the submission of the world to the papacy. And to attain this, the heads must be conquered first. Unquote. Well, that is the motto of the Jesuit order. The church to rule the world, the pope to rule the church, the Jesuits to rule the pope. The Jesuit priests were not required to dress in the traditional garb of Roman Catholic priests. In fact, their dress was a major part of their disguise. They presented themselves to the world in a variety of manners. They passed themselves off in a number of ways. Paris asserts that this is still true today. Quote, it is the same today. The 33,000 official members of the society operate all over the world in the capacity of her personnel, officers of a truly secret army containing in its ranks heads of political parties, high-ranking officials, generals, magistrates, physicians, faculty professors, etc. All of them striving to bring, out, uh, to bring about in their own sphere, opus dei, God's work. In reality, the plans of the papacy, unquote. Of course, the papacy calls itself God on earth, so everything that the Jesuits do is Opus Dei, God's work, right? What God are we That's talking right. about here? I think, Not the I God think of the Bible. we are talking about sure. that God <laughs> that is written in the Bible as the God of this world, the prince of the air, Satan and not mm -hmm. the creator God, not the creator father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to redeem all of mankind. That is not the God that we are talking about here. Now, they have often been known to join the religious persuasion which they wish to destroy. Having done this, they would manifest all of the destructive forces at their hands to weaken and tear down their sworn enemy of Protestantism. Paris again reports just such an event which took place in Scandinavia in the late 16th century. Quote, in 1574, Father Nicolai and other Jesuits were brought to the recently established School of Technology, where they became fervent Roman proselytizers while officially assuming Lutheranism. <coughs> Unquote. Dr. De Sanctis points out, Quote, mm -hmm. Despite all the persecution they, the Jesuits, have met with, they have not abandoned England, where there, where there are greater number of Jesuits than in Italy. There are Jesuits in all classes of society, in Parliament, among the English clergy, among the English Protestant laity, even in the higher stations. I could not comprehend how a Jesuit could be a Protestant priest or how a Protestant priest could be a Jesuit. But my confessor silenced my scruples by telling me omnia mundum mundis and that St. Paul became a Jew that he might save the Jews. It is no wonder, therefore, if a Jesuit should feign himself a Protestant for the conversion of Protestants. Unquote. The Jesuits are being 
everything to everybody. Read the Jesuit oath. The next part of this chapter is called Holy Murder. <laughs> Holy Murder. Isn't that an oxymoron? Absolutely. Murder is not above the means which, me which might be necessary to reach the desired end. The end justifies uh, the means. The general of the Jesuits will forgive any sins which are committed by the members of his satanic order. Any sins committed in reference to the Jesuit general, it is stated, quote, he also absorbs the irregularity issuing from bigamy, injuries done to others, murder, assassination, as long as these wicked deeds were not publicly known and this cause of a scandal, and as long as these deeds further the agenda of the church and the church may be the gainer in the end, then the end justifies the means. That the Jesuit priests have such liberties as murder is reflected in the following lengthy quote from Paris' book The Secret History of the Jesuits. Quote, I told you you have to read that. <laughs> mm, Amongst mm -hmm. the most criminal Jesuitic maxims, there is one which roused public indignation to the highest point and deserves to be examined. It is a monk or priest is allowed to kill those who are ready to slander him or his community. So the order gives itself the right to eliminate its adversaries and even those of its members who, having come out of it, are too talkative. This pearl is found in the theology of Father Lamy. There is another case where this principle finds its application. For this same Jesuit was cynical enough to write, quote, If a father, yielding to temptation, abuses a woman and she publicizes what has happened and because of it dishonors him, the same father can kill her to avoid disgrace. Unquote. In 1572, the Jesuits, with the help of Prince Henry III, were responsible for the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. At this infamous event, which took place on August 15, 1572, what a day! August 15th is the day of the Assumption of Mary, pagan queen mm -hmm. of heaven, Roman Catholic mother of God. Oh, and man. on that day, Mother Medici was marrying in Paris and in midnight the clocks, the, the, the bells rang and the St. Bartholomew's Massacre started. The 15th of August, 1572, the Jesuits murdered the Huguenot, meaning Protestant leaders gathered in Paris for the wedding of Princess Margaret, who was a Medici, a Roman Catholic and Henry of Navarre, a Huguenot. The murderers inspired Roman Catholics to slaughter thousands of Huguenot men, women and children. Thousands? Well, about 100,000 within a week. Henry of Navarre was not killed, but was forced to renounce Protestantism. Although his renunciation was insincere and he remained a Protestant until 1593. The number of victims in this Jesuit conspiracy is estimated to be at least 10,000. Well, I told you it's uh, 100,000 at least. In 1589, when Henry III was no longer useful to the Roman Catholic Church, what do they do then? He was assassinated by a monk by the name of Jacques Clément. Clément was called an angel by the Jesuit priest Camelet. Another Jesuit priest by the name of Guigard, who was eventually hanged, taught his students that Clément did nothing wrong. In fact, he voiced his regrets that Henry III had not been murdered earlier in the St. Bartholomew's Massacre. He instructed them with lessons such as this, quote, Jacques Clément has done a meritorious act inspired by the Holy Spirit. If we can make war against the king, 
then let us do it. If we cannot make war against him, then let us put him to death. We made a big mistake at the St. Bartholomew. We should have bled the royal vein. Unquote. Now, I'm sorry. I have to dig a little bit on the internet to read something to you in this regard. And it will take a little while for me to put it up, but that will put back into your mind how important it's going to be to read about the, uh, the Jesuit oath. Because I'm going to quote from that right now, so that's why I'm asking you, give me a second that I can look it up. What we were just talking about, what uh, the author Edmond Paris <laughs> wrote in his book, this quote, that Jacques Clément has done a meritorious act inspired by the Holy Spirit. We made a big mistake at St. Bartholomew. We should have bled the royal vein. Why can he say this? Because it says in the oath of the Jesuits, quote, when a Jesuit of the minor rank is to be elevated to command, he is conducted into the chapel of the convent of the order where there are only three others present, the principal or superior standing in front of the altar. On either side stands a monk, one of whom holds a banner or yellow of yellow and white, which are the papal colors, and the other a black banner with a dagger and a red cross above a skull and crossbones. Skull and bones, dudes! Listen! with the word I-N-R-I -I. and below them the words Iustrum Nicar Regis Impious the meaning of which is it is just, it is right to exterminate or annihilate impious or heretical kings, governments or rulers now do you know why in the Roman Catholic Church above the cross where Jesus is always hanging on you will find the letters I-N-R-I -I? not because it means Jesus Christ King of the Jews but because it says Iustrum Necker Regis Impious it was their right to kill the King of the Jews because he was in their eyes, a heretical and pious king. That's what they see of Jesus. That's what the pagan Romans saw of Jesus. And what is the Roman Catholic Church but a continuation of the pagan Roman Empire hidden under a veil of quote-unquote Christianity? Do you see how these things all come together when you do your research on the right points and you have two working brain cells that can connect the dots? There's nothing more interesting than true history. That's right. That's absolutely right, Jargon. They've hidden a lot of that from us. And you, you just go through layers and layers and layers and layers of obfuscation, man. But when it comes down to it, you have a choice. You can pull your Bible out and start reading it. And the Holy Spirit will quicken you, I believe. Just make sure that you pull out the right Bible. There we go. That's right. Because if you pull out an NIV, you're going to get some New Age doctrine embedded into your readings, whether you like it Absolutely. or not. The Jesuits' murderous way were not yet completed in the history of French Protestants. When Henry III was murdered, Henry of Navarre, a Huguenot, came to power. A hope for Catholic rebellion never materialized and Henry IV was allowed to reign. In 1592 an attempt was made to assassinate the Protestant king by a man named Barrière. Barrière admitted that he had been instructed to do so by Father Verrade, a Jesuit priest. 
In 1594, another attempt was made by Jean Châtel, who had been taught by Jesuit teachers and had confessed to the Jesuits that he was about what he was about to do. It was at this time that Father Guigard, the Jesuit teacher previously mentioned, was seized and hanged for his connection with this plot. In 1598, King Henry IV issued the Edict of Nantes, granting religious freedom to the Huguenots. They were allowed full civil rights and the right to hold public worship services in towns where they had congregations. This was the last straw. Henry IV had to be eliminated. This time the Jesuits would allow for more careful planning. Edmond Paris details the assassination of King Henry IV. Quote, On the 16th of May, 1610, <laughs> a few months before our beloved King James Bible was published, on the eve of his campaign against Austria, he was murdered by Ravaillac, who confessed having been inspired by the writing of Father Mariana and Suarez. These two sanctioned the murders of heretic tyrants or, tho or those insufficiently devoted to the papacy's interest. The Duke of Epimon, who made the king read a letter while the assassin was lying in wait, was a notorious friend of the Jesuits, and Michelet proved that they knew of this attempt. In fact, Ravaillac had confessed to the Jesuit father Daubigny just before, and when the judges interrogated the priest, he merely replied that God had given him the gift to forget immediately what he had heard in the confessional. Unquote. How convenient! To forget immediately what he had heard in the confessional. This is the spirit of our enemy. This is the ruthlessness of the Roman Catholic Church against those who will not bow their knee to Rome. Would God use this church to preserve his word? Wherever there is a conspiracy against God's people or God's word, there seems always to be the shadow of the Jesuit priest near. Often they present themselves as seemingly innocent to the proceedings around them when, in fact, they are the driving force behind such plots against God's it is often said that you can tell a lot about a man by taking a close look as, at his enemies. If a man is disliked by communists, then that shows that he is a non-communist and considered dangerous of their cause. If a man is disliked by the Roman Catholic Church, then this shows that he is not useful in spreading the Roman Catholic dogma. The same thing is true of the Bible. What did the Jesuits, the sworn enemy of truth, think of the authorized version? We <laughs> come to the gunpowder plot to show the hatred of the Roman Catholic Church against King James for initiating a translation which would not use the corrupt Latin Vulgate or the Jesuit Bible of 1582, the Reims-Dewey version, we must quote from Gustavus Paine's book, The Men Behind the King James Version. The account recorded took place in between 1605 and 1606. Quote, the story is too involved to give detail here, but on October 26, the Lord Chamberlain Monteagle received an unsigned letter begging him to stay away from Parliament on the day it opened. He took the letter to Robert Cecil, who on November 1st showed it to the king at a midnight meeting. The king shrewdly surmised a good deal of what it meant. Monday, November 4th, an agent of the royal party found in the cellar beneath the House of Lords a man named Guy Fawkes, disguised as a servant beside piles of faggots, billets of wood and masses of coal. The agent went away. Shortly Monteagle and one other came and talked, but, have no heed to, but gave no heed to Fawkes, who was still on guard until they were about to go. He told them he was a servant of Thomas Piercy, a well-known papist, 
Still later, at midnight, soldiers found Fawkes booted and spurred and with a lantern outside the cell door. He had taken few pains to conceal his actions. They dragged him into an alley, searched him, and found on him a tinder box and a length of slow match. In a fury now, they moved the faggots, billets and coal, and came upon barrel after barrel of powder, thirty-six barrels in all. Fawkes then confessed that he meant to blow up the House of Lords and the King. On November 6th, Percy, with others, rushed into an inn at Dunchurch, Warwickshire, with the news that the court was aware of their plan. By the 8th, the whole attempt had dearly failed. When Parliament met a week after the stated day, the King, calm, gracious and splendid, told what had happened, and then adjourned the meeting. At first, Fawkes refused to name any except Percy, who, with others, was killed in the course of a chase. In time he gave the names of all who would, blow, who would have blown up the House of Lords at a clap. Guy Fawkes was baptized at Saint-Michel-le-Belfray, York, April 16, 1570, son of Edward Fawkes, a proctor and advocate in the church courts of York. The father died and the mother married the papist. In 1603, Guy Fawkes went to Madrid to urge that Philip III invade England. Thus he was a confirmed traitor, though edged on and used by more astute plotters. Some of these men had been involved in the rising of, Earl of, uh, of, of the Earl of Essex. A number were former members of the Church of England. Most of them had some land and wealth. They were all highly disturbed beings, throwbacks, who meant to subvert the state and get rid of King James. Church and state, they were sure, must be one with fealty to the Pope. For nearly a year the plotters had been digging a tunnel from a distance, but had found the wall under the House of Lords nine feet thick. They had then got access to the cellar by renting a building. They had planned to kill the king, seize his children, stir up an open revolt with the aid of the Spaniards and Flanders, but Princess Elizabeth on the throne and marry her to a papist. Through all but one, Sir Everard Digby pleaded not guilty. The court, such as it was, condemned them all to death. That same week they were all hanged, four in St. Paul's churchyard, where John Overall, the translator, would have looked on and four in the yard of the old palace. Three months later came the trial of Henry Garnett, a Jesuit. Thought to be head of the Jesuits in England, brought up a Protestant, he knew of the plot, but had shrunk in horror from it, though he, had, uh, though he left the chosen victims to their fate. The court condemned him also to die. All this concerned the men at work on the Bible. At Garnet's hanging, May 3rd, in St. Paul's churchyard, John Overall, Dean of St. Paul's, took time off from his translating to be present. Very gravely and Christianly, he and the Dean of Winchester urged upon Garnet's true and lively faith on Godward, and fr a free and plain statement to the world of his offence. And if any further treason lay in his knowledge, he was begged to unburden his conscience and show a sorrow and destination of it. Garnet, firm in his beliefs, desired them not to trouble him. So after the men assigned to the gruesome duty he had, ha had hanged, drawn and quartered the victim, Dean Overall returned to St. Paul's and his Bible task. Unquote. Thus the gunpowder plot failed. As usual, where there was treachery, there was a Jesuit. Did the failure of this plan stop the Jesuits? Of course not. Garnet had allowed his drastic plan to be carried out too soon. He had forgotten the Jesuit rule to act a little at a time, surtout pas trop de zèle. Above all, not too much zeal. Now we made a broadcast on Hour of the Truth last year 
2015, yeah, to remember the gunpowder plot and digging also deep into that conspiracy. Look it up in the playlist Hour of the Truth to watch that for even more information on the gunpowder plot as I shared here with you in this reading of An Understandable History of the Bible, which I will bring to a completion here because we have reached almost the end of the time of our broadcast because I don't want to make it too long and I know that my brother in Christ Brett Norman over there has to fight a little bit against the headache and cannot take my yelling over the <laughs> microphone that got today. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fine. But uh, we will surely continue reading in this book An Understandable History of the Bible in one of the next broadcasts on Hour of the Truth. And uh, do you still have some uh, remarks that you want to close the broadcast here with uh, Brett? Oh, yeah. No, it's really interesting. You bring up last year the uh, gunpowder plot. You had reviewed that then, too. And uh, that was really, really a, a good a good hardy study mm. there and uh, certainly uh, very fitting for Americans and uh, those of you in the United Kingdom too because uh, certainly we have uh, suffered greatly from the Jesuits we really have and uh, but we still can learn from them that's the thing we can learn their history we can learn what they've done and we can get a great deal of, uh, you know, uh, foresight into what they might do in the future. Right, mm -hmm. Yarg? Well, yeah, that, that, that's right, yeah. But I don't think that we have much to learn from the Jesuit order. I think we have much, much more to learn from yeah. our Lord Jesus Christ in the first place. That's But we can right. learn, of course, of the doings of the Jesuits in history to make predictions to the future and to understand the present time that we are living in right now. And a part of that, what I was just reading here of that book and uh, the finding by Henry III of the Edict of Nantes was, uh, or uh, Henry IV of the Edict of Nantes, is very important because uh, the further you go into the secret history of the Jesuits, and not only there, also in other books, um, in Alexander Hislop's To Babylon's, it also appears, um, the story about how the so-called Sun King, Louis XIV, uh, Louis XIV, um, one of the French kings that uh, everybody knows, uh, the Sun King at the time, he revoked the Edict of Nantes. And how did he do that? Because of the influence of his Jesuit confessor, Father de la Chaise. And that is a very, very interesting story, and that comes up in the book The Two Babylons from Alexander Hislop, and I think I also mentioned that in the book reading um, The Secret History of the Jesuits, which I'm doing right now, but you have to understand I haven't been in there for a few weeks, and I read the book in German and in English simultaneously, as I have done All Roads Lead to Rome. So I'm not quite sure that I read it there, but I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure I read it there. And that is a very, very interesting story. And from those plots, from those conspiracies in the past, Brett, we can learn to mm -hmm. uh, to understand what happens in these days. As we were talking in the introduction yes. of this broadcast, what is going on on the high level, on the white pope and the black pope with the election of a black pope from South America, Venezuela? What is that plan? listening to what Alan Greenspan that in that interview and all that, only when you have knowledge mm -hmm. of these kind of conspiracies in the past, you can even try to understand what is happening right now and what is probably going to happen in the future. You know, everybody mm -hmm. says, history repeats itself, history repeats itself, but when they do not know history, because it is not taught in our school system, it is not taught in our universities. It is not shown in our libraries. It is surely not shown on the television. When we <laughs> do not know history, how can we then see that it repeats itself? You can't. <laughs> And that's why studies like these 
are so important. And that's why reading books and not novels, but factual books, historical books, protest books, books on religion, books on politics, like the things that Tom Fress reads on Inquisition Update, Global Vatican, Rome and Civil Liberty, and like book readings mm -hmm. that I did, Rulers of Evil, Babylon Mystery Religion, and now All Roads Lead to Rome, and upcoming books, and this one, are so important for an understanding. If you do not read those things or comparable things to these, I don't say you have to just read these books, or like, for example, the book of all books next to the Bible, Romanism and the Reformation from Henry Gretton Guinness. First the Bible, second that book. When you do not read these things, you have no just view on the present, on the past, and surely cannot make complete or righteous predictions for the future. And if you cannot do that, you will always live in fear. And that's just what they want. Only when you have Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you accept that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross, shed his blood for your sins, rose on the third day and went up to our Father in heaven, when you believe and confess that, you will have the peace that he promised you. Otherwise, you will run from tribulation to tribulation and from fear to fear. And you are just a bowl in the hands of the powers that be. That's why they have so many ball games. Look what they do to that poor thing. Mm -hmm. So, Brett, we've come to the end. Do you have any closing remarks for today? Oh, I was just thinking about the Bible, you know, and uh, just how important it is, you know, and and uh, how important it is to actually memorize. And, uh, you know, I, I haven't probably been as uh, disciplined as I could be in that department, but um, it never hurts to... Uh, emphasize the fact that uh, scripture really is the ultimate authority and we can see that in our own lives you know that's part of the one of the really really powerful things about being a born again a born again christian that will profess that to anyone without any fear and and have no uh hesitation about it because the enemy wants us to be hesitant, wants us to be confused, wants us to be accepting of this world system without questioning his authority. And we need to just kick that down and just get it out because it's just a lie. Christ died to save us from our iniquities. So if we can just humble ourselves a little more and read his word, we're going to be in a much better position to handle what the enemy has to throw at us in the future. And that's all I've got. Yeah, we can put on the full armor of God. There we go. Mm -hmm. And when we have the two-edged sword to fight with, which is not a material sword, mm -hmm. then... The sword of the Spirit. Exactly. Then we are equipped for this fight, which is a spiritual fight, because we are fighting against, against powers and principalities in high places. We are not fighting against people. We, as Bible-believing Christians, we love our enemy. We love the people. But like with the Nicolaitans, we hate their works. We hate their doctrine. We expose their doctrine and their plans. We love the people, but we hate their hierarchy, just as Jesus did when he said, 
this about the Nicolaitans. This is in, if I'm not mistaken, Revelation 2. Do I have that right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I have to look this up here. I want to make the right quote because a lot of people say that, um, well, look, Jesus hates the Nicolaitans. No, it is, uh, it is not that. I think it is Revelation 3 even. Uh, mm. oh, I don't, I don't find that. I don't find I that idea. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking, <laughs> looking at this, but sure. Uh, I know it's not in uh, chapter one, in chapter two. Um, but this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So this is in Revelation chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The deeds, not the Nicolaitans. We are to love our enemy. We are to love every man. And we are not to do harm to any man in the physical way. But we have to teach That's right. and preach with a double-edged sword the word of God. And we hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans of that time, that are the people of the Roman Catholic Church or representing the Roman Catholic Church the synagogue of Satan today we hate their deeds we hate their hierarchy we hate their doctrine we expose their doctrine but we love the people the people are betrayed souls with this mm -hmm. I think we should come to an end on this broadcast on Hour of the Truth for today with my guest, Brett Norman from Minnesota in the United States of Romerica, and reading <laughs> another little part in the book of An Understandable History of the Bible by Samuel C. Gipp. I hope you guys enjoyed listening and watching this video, and I hope to see you next time. Until next time, Juggler 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off, and goodbye. God bless you. Bye-bye.